Hi, in this video we're going to introduce software testing. We're going to look at what it is, the different types of software tests that we could introduce and the different levels at what we could test our software. Um, we'll start off first of all with a sort of a broad definition of what software testing is. It's important to say up front about the importance of testing. It really is a crucial aspect, an essential aspect of any type of um, development. And what testing is concerned with, well, you can see it here, software testing is the process of validating and verifying. These are the two key elements, to validate and to verify our software. And in particular, that it satisfies uh, the needs of, use of those who are using um, or are going to use or are associated with whatever it is we're developing. So in terms of what we mean by both of those, when we say validating, we mean checking that the software that we've created, the system in terms of its functionality and its behavior is actually the behavior and the functionality that is needed, that is desired, that we are creating the right thing. So that is one of the key purposes of software testing. The notion of verification then is to check that if we are creating the right thing, that we are creating it in the right way that it is software that works as intended, it's not buggy, it's not going to fall over, it's, not going, to, it's going to actually do its job. So software is here to validate and to verify. When we think about the different types of software test that uh, we can introduce, it, it broadly breaks into two different categories. You've got functional and non-functional testing. And it's a somewhat of an arbitrary definition here because there can be a little bit of grayness in terms of some types of tests between them. But when we're talking about functional testing, in essence, we're talking about the designed functionality, the designed behavior of the system. Uh, these are generally things that are captured through use cases uh, where the user is saying he or she wants to do this for this particular reason and have a certain type of behavior or within sort of uh, specification documents. So if you like, it's, it's more the formal description of what the software ought to do in terms of its functionality. And any of the functional tests are really concerned to make sure that it does what it's meant to do. Uh, often known as, as black box testing in the sense that you sort of view it as a black box. You don't know or really care about how it works inside. You're just interested in terms of the inputs and the interaction with that black box that it acts in the way that it ought to act. Non-functional testing then, it is one that is more concerned with aspects of quality of how the software runs. And you can break non-functional testing into many different areas. You can see some of them here in terms of usability testing, portability, uh, the performance, how, how responsive it is, and, and load and stress testing. We'll look briefly at each of these ones. Uh, so whenever we think about usability, and I suppose it's worth important here, you may think functional, non-functional, functional is more important. Not really. Both of these really are uh, really key, and hopefully you'll see these as we look at these different aspects. So in terms of usability, this is asking questions about how easy is it for the users, the people who are going to use this software, to learn to use it and then actually to be able to use it. So there's different aspects there in terms of becoming familiar with software. And then when you are familiar, can you use it in a fast, efficient manner? Uh, so that's all the domain of usability. Portability, it very much depends on, on the system, how, how key a component this is. But if you're developing something that is intended to run across or on different IT platforms, different IT devices, then notions of portability are quite important. And it's checking to see that, yes, whilst it might run perfectly fine in the development machine, in terms of the types of device and platform that the users are going to use, does it run seamlessly on those as well? And you've got to test that uh, to, to assure yourself that that is the case. Performance testing. Um, so this, as mentioned here, tests how well the system performs under a set of, of given conditions. Often here we're talking about how responsive it is. So if the user uh, starts a certain task or, or commences a piece of functionality, does that piece of functionality complete within a reasonable period of time? Is it fast? Is it responsive? Is there again a good uh, user experience from using the software? 
Now, somewhat related to this, but, but also certainly different, is the notion of load or stress testing. So the idea of, of load testing is that, again, for a particular system, normally they're designed, well, they can't do the work of an individual user, but if you have many different users, or if an individual user can start many different tasks, there you're, you would have designed the software to say that this is a system that should work perfectly fine with up to 250 users. Load testing is where you actually go out of your way to simulate or to actually model what happens whenever you do have 250 users using the system. Can you verify and check that your system will support that number and will still provide acceptable performance to each of those different users um, as they interact with it? Stress testing then sort of pushes this beyond that. It says, okay, we may have designed it for 250 users. What happens if we have 1,000 or 2,000? So there you push it and, and you sort of have a look at what happens um, to the software as, uh, as, as, as you're subjecting it to more and more stress. How is it going to feel? Is it going to feel gracefully? Is it going to feel at all? Um, and it's looking at those types of aspects. So, so all actually important uh, elements if you're producing something which is intended to be mass market in terms of the software that you're creating, you want to give a good, safe user experience for all the people using it. And these types of non-functional tests help test that and to show that it is the case. There's different levels then we can do our testing at, and you have a nice sort of V-shaped diagram that illustrates this. Uh, so in terms of our V, on the left-hand side of the V, you've got uh, the requirements analysis, where we're, this is quite a traditional one, where we're sort of capturing the requirements. We're defining some functional specifications from that. We've got a high-level design, and we've got sort of more detailed, low-level unit or component design. And on the other side, you've got these sort of typical types of tests that would be associated with it. So in terms of unit testing, integration testing, system testing, and user acceptance testing, or UAT. Uh, and you can have different plans then that actually tie these two things together. So for example, your user acceptance test plan is the type of thing that when you've built your requirements analysis, you can then do your UAT test plan to, to give you the types of things that the user would be asked to verify by way of, of you assuring yourself that that functionality has been provided. Um, so, so whilst this is sort of presented in terms of a down and an up, um, it, it doesn't have to, I mean, you, you can do these tests at different points. You don't have to do one leading on to the next. They can be mixed up um, through different processes. But let's look at the, each of the different types here. So unit testing or component testing at that particular level, it's um, sort of more functional or, or, or in the non-functional testing, just depends what applies for that particular unit. But it's down at the level of um, a module, a class, and testing that that module or that class does what it's meant to do. Uh, generally speaking, this is something that the programmer who is crafting and creating that, that particular unit, that they will be closely involved with and, and, and he or she will, will write unit tests and, and will develop a suite of them. There may be a separate tester as well, but that often falls to the, the developer in terms of making sure that, that their code works as intended. And, and you have a number of sort of nice unit test frameworks that we'll look at in one of the later videos. Next level up from that is integration testing. So this says if we have a bunch of different modules that are intended to come together and to interact with one another, well, can we test that they actually do come together and interact in the way that they're meant to? So integration testing is checking these things fit together. Uh, and we can look at the interfaces that are defined. We can check that things do suitably connect, error conditions are handled, and things along those lines. Next level up beyond that then is system testing. And this is sort of like the grandest form of integration testing that when everything comes together and forms the complete system, then we should test that. And there we're looking at high level functionality, we're looking at non-functional tests and making sure that the system actually behaves in the way that we believe it is meant to behave. Um, ideally here, the test environment, the environment within which we test it, it should be as reflective of the real environment, the real user environment as possible. And as mentioned, if you think about portability testing or stress or load testing, sometimes that can be a challenge to provide uh, an actual environment if it can be run across many different types of devices, or if you're looking at potentially supporting many thousands of concurrent users.
Ultimately, the most important type of test is acceptance tests. These are the people who will be using this software and it is their feedback in terms of does it work for them? Does it provide the functionality they're looking for? Is it easy to use? Does it work fine across their different devices? Do they have a good experience? Um, so user acceptance testing does involve getting your actual users using the software. And, and just as a reminder, if we're talking about waterfall or iterative approaches, both of them apply here. Uh, it's generally good to get your users involved as soon as you possibly can in terms of doing early uh, UAT testing. Now we're going to sort of round this short talk off with uh, sort of a look at seven principles um, that sort of underpin uh, testing. So they're, they're sort of words of wisdom or advice that, that generally hold and are worthwhile um, being mindful of and adhering to. So the first principle. So testing does not prove there's no defects. So the only thing a test can prove is that whether or not there are defects present. So if you have a test and it fails, you know there is a defect. If all of your tests pass, that doesn't mean the software is bug free. It just means all of your tests have passed. So tests show there's defects. They do not prove an absence of defects. That's an important component. And that sort of gets into, again, this, this sort of sol uh, sense of sort of false reassurance that, oh, well, your tests are perfectly passing. Nothing could possibly go wrong. But if you're not testing the right area, if you're not testing it in the right way, there may still be defects there. Uh, exhaustive testing is impossible. This ties into the first one. So you might go, well, we'll just test everything. You can't realistically do this for any, any piece of software of a sensible size. There are just too many different combinations of data. Even if you do get into the point of looking at representative values and edge values and all of those types of things, you are looking at very large numbers of potential tests to the point where you sort of get into diminishing returns. So often a lot of testing says that we have a certain amount of time and effort and resource and money that we can put into it. And you want to focus that time and effort and resource and money on the tests that are going to be of most high value. So it's, it's risk based, it's priority based. Uh, and you test those areas and you test them well. Uh, that's important to, to get right. Test early. This ties into the other part that the longer you wait until you discover a bug, generally the bigger the impact is. And this is very much true of user acceptance testing. Um, if you find that the piece of functionality you're doing or the non-functional how it behaves is not what the user's looking for, that's a painful thing to learn. You want to learn that as soon as you possibly can so that the development hopefully can take that into account, can adapt, um, can rework to it. So test early, all types of testing, as early as you possibly can. Um, software defects likely to be grouped together statistically just seems to be the case. So whenever there are bugs, they generally are found in, in, in one sort of area or a small number of particular areas. So you find a bug in one area, it's good to test that a little bit more rigorously just to see if anything else comes out as well. Uh, like pesticides, repeated testing can become ineffective. And this, this is one of the lulling into false sense of security, that if you keep using the same set of tests and developing your code and testing it against those set of tests, um, you'll probably come to a point where it works perfectly for that set of tests. Um, but because you're always using that same set, you're not sort of exploring other possibilities. You run the risk then of, of missing bugs that are being introduced into it. So it's good not to become too reliant on one set of tests. To every so often go back at it or to put a fresh pair of eyes onto it and to see if you can introduce more tests, similar tests, slightly different tests. Um, because they will help just make sure you've got a fresh set and that's more likely than if there are defects for those defects to be uh, discovered. Um, testing is context dependent, a uh, phenomenon we have here. So it's just to remind you that when we are testing things, ultimately we're testing, um, it depends on the level as well, but we are testing one specific type of application. And depending on if this is some cloud-based service or a mobile app, um, or a game or whatever it's going to be, different types of tests are going to be more appropriate and different emphasis will be appropriate. So you always want to contextualize your testing depending upon what it is you're doing. And that's where the, the risk-based assessment, the priority-based assessment uh, comes into it 
as well. Um, absence of errors fallacy, this is the last one here. So just to remind you that, that whilst the, the testing that you're doing, if it shows there's no bugs, brilliant. But ultimately, you need to create software that is usable and useful to the user. So if you create bug-free software that isn't actually useful, it's pointless, utterly pointless. So the key thing to get right is that you have useful software. That's why it's important to do user acceptance testing and all of this here. And if it's not useful, who cares about bugs? Because it simply won't be used. So key takeaway is only one in this particular one. Software testing really is important. It's the type of thing we all want to do, to do early and to do well. So test your code, test it well.